All right, everybody, welcome back to the Metric Stack podcast. Today, I'm joined by John Taylor. And John says he does things on the internet for a living. So John is actually currently one of our colleagues here at Clipfolio. He's the director of marketing and does SEO and marketing operations as a consulting gig as well. John's also the co-host of Humans of MarTech podcast and perhaps most importantly, the dad to four kids. So welcome, John. Great to have you here. And of course, I'm joined by my co-host, uh, Lauren Thibodeau as well. Thanks. The kids are definitely off the internet as much as possible, though that's tough these days. No kidding. And we may hear, who knows, we may hear them during the podcast. Probably. Probably. Great to have you and, and be chatting with you, John. So we're going to talk about MQLs today, or marketing qualified leads. But before we dive into those details, could you just set the stage? What context should we have in mind as we're having this conversation today? Yeah. So in terms of setting the stage for marketing qualified leads, it comes back down to like the most basic element of marketing. What's the purpose of marketing? It's to drive revenue. And for depending on the business, the strategy and tactics of driving revenue will look a little bit differently. I think we'll talk a little bit about product led versus like your traditional B2B sales approach. However, no matter how marketing works or whatever strategy and tactics, you do need a measurement, a metric in place to gauge lead quality. And you need a metric in place, a kind of a pre-revenue metric that, that marketing can go towards, have quotas, have targets, and then be able to optimize towards. So lots of people are calling things different names these days, MQL, PQL, whatever you want to call it. Marketing at the base level needs some way to, to predict uh, revenue and to be able to generate qualified leads. So John, why don't we actually just start for our audience? Why don't we just paint a quick picture? Because, you know, a lead... An, an anonymous user hits the website. Let's start there. You know, what are sort of the the big marketing steps and the the namings of, of each of those steps? Yeah, absolutely. So when we're talking about marketing qualified leads, we're really talking about one stage in the overall customer life cycle. In a lot of like marketing operations environments like HubSpot or Marketo, when you're talking about the life cycle, what you're really talking about is the the life cycle of known contacts. So you will use reporting to understand your sessions and your top of funnel traffic. But at the end of the day, like the MQL exists in the known universe of known known contacts. So what we'll see typically, just use HubSpot as an example. Uh, I, I like HubSpot's model because their lifecycle model is very simple and out of the box, they kind of define what they want you to follow. So you'd have subscriber, somebody who signs up for a newsletter, you have lead, somebody who's done something with some sort of intent, be it fill out a form or respond to a marketing campaign, marketing qualified lead, which would be somebody who's reached a threshold that marketing deems uh, worthy of additional follow-up or believes has a high likelihood to close. And you have your sales qualified lead, that's the initial step where sales takes takes over like one-to-one -one communications, your opportunity stage when we can predict revenue. And then you'll have your customer and evangelist stage, which, you know, obviously paying customers and then evangelist, something like NPS, a high NPS score or referrals or something like that. Do you find that most companies are actually using this kind of a funnel as they think about the contacts that they are capturing, you know, through some sort of a lead form? Whether they call it a marketing qualified lead or not, yes, I find most, certainly in my, my marketing operations consulting experience, almost everybody uses something like this. It may not be called an MQL, uh, but if you have a marketing automation platform you or a CRM, you need some way to organize your leads. And if you don't have that, it becomes uh, a huge pain to be able to pass people over to sales and, and all kinds of issues that can happen. That's great, John. And you mentioned off the top, just in your context, sort of some people call this different things, PQL, MQL. Can you give us some of the nuances in this metric and what people should be listening for? Yeah. So if you come from like a hub, like using HubSpot, you might be used to their default fields. In Marketo, for instance, you have the revenue cycle modeler, which is basically a blank canvas and then you could name anything anything you want, right? You don't have to call it marketing qualified lead. You call it marketing engaged or marketing interested or something like that. So the nuance I really think is thinking less about how do we set up and define MQLs, more thinking of that base element of how am I going to gauge lead quality in a way that makes sense for my business? So if I have something, 
a proxy for MQL because maybe I don't, maybe I'm a product led organization. We only have a very small sales team. They're only focused on expansion revenue or something like that. I still need a way as a marketer to be able to determine what are the activities that are generating revenue and how can I create and find more of those, those types of people. So I think it's the, the concept behind marketing qualified lead, which is so important to really understand when we're talking about this. And it, so this funnel is really interesting because it does, uh, quality is, the, is, is really the name of the game here. So it's marketing quality, and then obviously it goes to kind of sales quality. Do you find that there is a, a huge drop off? You know, let's talk about, you know, leads to come in and obviously marketers want to get the best fit leads in the door, but that's hard. So the criteria that you're setting you know, is it stringent? Is it is it not as stringent? And then, of course, you've got to think downstream as well to then the next drop off, which is to go over to sales qualified. And, you know, ideally, it would be a one to one. You get an awesome contact who turns into a marketing qualified who turns into sales qualified. But that's probably not the way it goes. Yeah, it, it doesn't, but it should be. And that's what we aim for when we set up an MQL model. And it's interesting you mentioned the sales handoff point, like conceptually, the way that at least in a, an organization with a strong sales team, conceptually, the way the MQL process usually works is that you generate an MQL, marketing qualifies it, signals it to sales, sales makes an immediate kind of eyeball determination. Do I follow up with them? Yes, no. They do follow up and move to that first sales stage. That conversion point from marketing qualified to, let's say, sales qualified, super important. We call that the acceptance rate, the MQL acceptance rate. And I know we often want to talk about benchmarks, but it's the MQL definition will vary so much between organization to organization. However, like you definitely want to benchmark it internally and understand like, what is my level? And I would say, if you don't know what your benchmark should be for this based on your process, aim for 80%, right? A minus in school terms and keep pushing that up higher and higher. And that acceptance rate really tells you, do sales want to work with these folks or not? which kind of helps provide that feedback mechanism into the MQL model itself. The other component of this is just defining MQLs. Like, how do we define an MQL? And that is really interesting to me. John, I'm going to play devil's advocate on that a bit. And you knew I was going to, right? So looking forward to it, Alan. Yeah, for sure. So, so you said that the, you know, like every, every, every flow is going to be different from company to company. And, you know, you, you threw that benchmark out there. But I actually think that benchmark might be completely irrelevant for certain companies. Like what happens if you've qualified, you know, 100, 100 leads, 100 contacts as marketing qualified, and you happen to have then a split and you can say, well, we will treat certain ones as self-serve and certain ones as, you know, sales, you know, handheld. How does, how does that sort of get into the thinking there? Well, and that's, that's exactly a great segue into like product led marketing, right? The, so many organizations now almost lean exclusively in the early stages of the buying process for that product engagement. In that case, like you're, if you're using an, a hybrid model, which that's what we're using here at Clipfolio, the combination of product led engagement and kind of sales signals that we can use on the MQL itself to push it over you have a different game, right? And I think that's something that's really interesting because if you're looking at MQLs, you need a signal, a process that says, do this next. In a product-led organization, you might be just kicking off a series of onboarding flows. You may be kicking off in-op tours. You may not actually ever go to or over to a salesperson, or you may queue up a support call or a success call. So what really matters here is that your your succession of actions leads to you know moving people further down the funnel. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a really important point, right? So you know the the bucket of MQLs might then split, and you know a certain flow will go down sort of a self serve automated path, and a different flow based on different criteria might then become sales qualified. So I think benchmarking internally is probably the right advice here. Make sure that you're always increasing the quality of that handoff, but you know, you can definitely have more than one step in that funnel. Yeah, exactly. What have you seen? So John, you've seen, you know, a number of different companies in your consulting work. You've worked in a number of different shops. 
what are some of the pitfalls? Where do people fall down on this metric and what can they do to really be successful? The first and most common problem is not having anything in place for this piece of process, right? It just becomes sign up on some form in the product and then it's just like the automation system fills up with leads, sales doesn't know what they're working on. Uh, marketing can't really be held accountable to what they're driving. And so it's it's missing altogether. The next issue is, is that we we swing completely the other way. We get like extremely academic and existential, but what is an MQL? And it, it becomes almost counterproductive because we're we're obsessing about getting like the best, best fit. Anybody who gets rejected from the system, we we have to pour over. Like the MQL is a very fluid thing. It's meant to like if you had an MQL list in your automation system, it sh- it should be constantly seeing new names, but it should be about the same size. Some days it goes down as sales takes more people. Some days it's up if sales is on vacation. So I think people overcomplicate this too much or they just completely ignore having this tracking in their place. And as a when I was in operations consulting, that was one of the biggest programs that we did, pretty standard work that we would go in, help people either fine tune their model or implement a model uh, with their team and have a have a strong process there. Okay, that's great. I, I want to pick up on that for one second. Just say, is there anyone who shouldn't track this metric? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So there will be a whole class of people in the SaaS, SaaS software industry who will find this extremely irrelevant, right? Um, the idea of having an MQL in place, I think a lot of the strength of the MQL model comes from the handoff point to sales. So if you're looking into internally, you don't have a sales team who's converting new, new customers or maybe focused only on expansion, it may not be the best model for you. However, you do need, in my opinion, some kind of proxy metric in place there that is kind of an intermediary between, um, you know, a new lead and a highly like a new customer. So something there that marketing can measure. So you can do without it, but you do need to have some kind of quality measure in place. What do you what do you typically use as that quality measure? You know, is there again, is it very specific to the company? You know, are there certain things that always should be part of, you know, an MQL quality threshold? That's a really good question. So an MQL model itself could be, you know, at its most basic, just take a look at the the definition, marketing qualified lead. Like I have worked with, with bootstrap, small, small startups that are actually like marketing just hand bombs over one or two contacts to sales every day. And that's, that's the quality measure. Did it pass marketing sniff test? Not very scalable, but uh, actually pretty effective and usually has a high conversion rate. The other measures of quality then become like when we're using an automation system like HubSpot, Marketo, Pardot, whatever, we then have additional data that we can put into our input. So in terms of developing your, your marketing qualified definition, that's where I would root the answer to the question here you need to kind of understand the best fit profile of your customer. So, you know, what's the job titles? What's the roles? What's the country? What's the revenue or industry that may be part of it? And also typically accounting for some of the engagement that happens there. And that's where like you'll often hear lead scoring models are completely tied in with the MQL model because it's a really clean way to do things, right? You have people who come in, they match these attributes, you sign a score based on each of these attributes. They do these things, I'll sign a score for that. And once they hit a certain score threshold, boom, we, we move them over to sales and, and call it a, a quality measure. So it's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice system for a lot of folks and like automation systems like HubSpot and Marketo make it super easy to, to set these up. So yeah, it's kind of like a more universal approach to qualification. Okay, so you're you're saying just to make it real, you're saying that we're gonna we're gonna watch this contact. You know, they've now looked at the pricing page three times, so they they get a check mark for that. You know, they've downloaded a certain white paper. Maybe they're from a certain geo that we know is sort of a best fit geo. Maybe their company name triggers. You know, that this is a company that we want to do business with. So, combination of kind of firmographic, demographic, and behavioral things, right? That then make this into a a marketing qualified. And and I think you're right. It's going to be different for every company. Yeah. And that mix is completely different. Like if you're in product led, you you would say, I don't do MQLs. I do PQLs. Okay. Uh, But you just veer everything towards the engagement score. Mm -hmm. And I think what I see happen most often is a combination 
you know, a mix, a nice mix of the two things, your attributes to verify if they're fit that profile and then the engagement with both your, if you're in software and with your product and your marketing activities determine, is this person actually like interested in, in what we're going to do? So can you think or share with us uh, perhaps an example of something that you've seen a company change, pivot on based on either some MQL data or their MQL acceptance rate? What are some things, some tactical actions that companies can take if they notice there's a, an issue or something's dropping here? Yeah, so definitely there's there's some metrics that you want to keep a track of. You mentioned the MQL acceptance rate. I would also look at your MQL to opportunity rate. You know, if you're, you, you want a high acceptance rate for sales to work those contacts, but you also need to keep paying attention to further down the, the funnel. I know in my, in my operations role, we would often go into places that didn't have any of this tracking and we started uncovering insights. So the first thing that you want to do with these types of insights, assuming you have the data behind the scenes, you have cohort analysis. Okay, who makes it to the opportunity stage when I send them from an MQL? And then sometimes we'd be able to pick out common threads or common programs like your demo request, which seems obvious to, to, to us, but your demo request program has a high probability of having an opportunity associated with it. Um, so the MQL is a metric, but it's as much a process as well. And I think that's when you, I don't know, I don't sound tacky, but you embrace the process of an MQL. But when you really have a good handoff point between sales and marketing, like sales and marketing are the are different sides of the same coin, like really need to work together. So what I've seen work the best is when sales and marketing agree on a definition and act on that definition. But it seems like this is a, a learn. I mean, as, as with any metric, this is a learning metric that you're monitoring, you're looking at it, you're segmenting it. And you're feeding that back into your definition of the best fit customer. I suspect that you're using this then to tweak the website, the flow of the website, the positioning and messaging of your of your 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 product and your benefits. Like I imagine this is just a, a cyclical story that should get better and better all the time. It, it, exactly. And we talked about hangups with this. Like the biggest hang up is not having something in place now. Cause this is like Again, it's a process, it's a metric, but it's also like a focal point of optimization efforts. My lead to MQL rate is, is, is garbage. I need to understand what programs I have out in market that are converting, you know, from a demand generation perspective, I need to know are my ad campaigns not churning in MQLs. So it's super useful to have this as a target. I know in other instances, like sales team will say, give me X number of MQLs every, every month. And as a marketer, I actually really like that because it gives us a, a clear objective that we can go towards um, between the two teams. So in the context of a, a really high growth company, marketers have their hands full. They're really busy. They're wearing many hats. Do you have any comments? And, and it might be in a couple different you know, types of business. Any comment on how often marketers should be looking at this metric and looking to adapt, change, tweak, learn? Yeah, in terms of time frame, like it, it, there's a couple stages. So the first stage is when you deploy this metric. I would be looking. I know when I've done it in my past, I look at the lead list every day. Like even just passing through it to make sure like it's a good it's it, it's a good list. Good profiles are coming through. But beyond that, once you get that initial setup, I'd say you're looking at a weekly. If you if you're able to watch watch it on a dashboard alongside other metrics, look at your targets. Make sure that you're within within your normal levels. But more importantly, I find like if you're the companies that do MQL models very well, will often have either a monthly or biweekly sync with the sales team, like talking with the sales lead or somebody else on the team, making sure are the MQLs good? Is the process working? Are you guys following up with your, your MQLs fast enough, right? An MQL that comes in through a demo request sits there in some queue for 72 hours. It's it's as good as useless. So there's a lot behind the process that's used to, to monitor this metric and, and to reinforce it. John, you mentioned a few other metrics that you like keeping an eye on. And, and I mean, one of them that you mentioned just a second ago was sort of the MQL to win rate or win MQL to opportunity rate. Are, are there other metrics that you should be paying attention to or that can sort of give us early signs of something broken or validate something? Yeah, so your lead to MQL, uh, really strong metric to see, 
you know, are you able to progressively move people through your your database, for instance, through the their customer profile? And then the MQL to SQL, that's great for your acceptance rate. Does sales like what they're seeing? MQL to opportunity, is sales actually converting these people and, and moving, advancing them through the funnel? So those are the big ones. MQL to customer, of course, you're going to measure that as well. Um, but it's depending on your sales cycle, it might be a longer term. So the MQL acceptance rate is really nice because it usually you're talking you know, less than 24 hours to be able to get an indicator of what's happening. Fantastic. And and really wide ranging conversation. John, love your insights. As we're about to wrap up, do you have any kind of final words of advice for folks? Well, we tease this out throughout the, the, the interview, but the idea of is the MQL model right for me is an important question. Like you can go on the internet now, as you will with any marketing term, find that the MQL is actually dead, according to some marketers, but we, maybe we're reviving it. But it's nevertheless a super important process to think about. If you're doing PQLs, product qualified leads, or some other version of product led marketing, everything we've talked about is still relevant. You're still going to have these inflection points where you're going to move a contact from one stage to the next, where you're going to change the messaging from one stage to the next. So I would make sure to study the MQL model, particularly if you're if you're newer to marketing or demand generation, to understand you know how do future models like PQLs get built off of this. So the MQL is dead. Long live the MQL. John, thank you so much for joining us. John Taylor is Director of Marketing at Clipfolio. Thanks for all your wisdom today. Yeah, thanks for having me on. If you enjoyed today's conversation about metrics and data, be sure to check out Metric HQ, our online resource for the metrics that matter most to you and your business.